Uh, I want to welcome all of you to the fourth and final meeting of this iteration of the Pickwick Club from the Santa Cruz Dickens Fellowship. Um, before I turn things over to our leader and discussion uh, presenter, Karen Hathaway, I have a few announcements that I want to make. As, as most of you, I, I suspect, are aware, uh, the central coast of California has been battered by terrible storms in the past few weeks. And uh, today, fortunately, we have sunshine and dry weather, and we are in the uh, recuperation stage. But it has been a difficult time for many people. Many people have had to evacuate their homes. Um, the town of Capitola, which is a beach town, has been battered. Uh, you've probably seen images of this. So uh, I, I just want to let you know that um, we are okay. We are going to make it through this, this difficult time. And I send good wishes out to uh, all friends of Dickens who are uh, affected and have been affected. By this, <laughs> Don't this let us forget your sister. Um, I also want to uh, mention and send good wishes in particular to one longtime member of the Santa Cruz group, and that's Peggy Waters. Uh, and Peggy has had some, some health difficulties recently. And so uh, I, I just wanted to uh, send good wishes to her. I don't know if Peggy is going to be able to join us today via uh, Zoom. Um, I have some other announcements that I that I want to make too. Um, I, you, those of you who were here last year, that is I have. in um, yes, and I, it's probably a good idea for uh, people to mute themselves because that way we can avoid getting feedback from uh, people, particularly the person who's who's calling in on the on the telephone. Um, so thank you for cooperating with that. Uh, those of you who were here before the, I guess it was the November meeting, will recall that we voted to make a contribution, an end of year contribution to the Holy Cross Food Pantry in Santa Cruz. And uh, we made a gift of $1,000 to that, to that food pantry and have received a very nice thank you note from the Holy Cross Food Pantry. Um, that was a gift that we made from the excess funds from the membership dues of the, of the, of the uh, fellowship. And it is time to renew memberships. Uh, the dues for membership in the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club are $30 per year, and they can be mailed to Courtney at her home address, uh, which uh, I, I'm not going to put into the chat, but she, Courtney will be sending you a reminder, all people who have attended today and who are regular members of the, of the fellowship meeting. Um, also wanted to let you know that uh, in starting in February, we will have the first of three sessions on the mystery of Edwin Drood. That's the next novel that we will be dealing with. And uh, those will be led by uh, board of directors of the Friends of Dickens Project member, Carl Wilson. And there will be more information about that that will be sent uh, by, out by Courtney. Also, another announcement, um, February 7th, as, as I assume that all of you, most of you know, is Dickens' birthday. And in celebration of the birthday, uh, the Dickens Project is hosting its second annual Dickens Day of Writing event. Um, that is an event for high school students, high school juniors and seniors in the Santa Cruz area and adjacent counties to help them improve their writing. It's a one day event that takes place at the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz. And we are seeking volunteer writing mentors. 
And there's more information about that that can be uh, found on the Dickens Project website. Again, you'll be receiving information from Courtney about this. Um, so uh, with those announcements out of the way, may, may I ask uh, as a reminder for people to mute themselves during Karen's presentation, you may use the raised hand function and uh, also physically raise your hand and wave if you would like to speak or ask a question. But I'll now turn things over to our discussion leader, Karen Hathaway, and thank her again for, for leading this uh, discussion. So Karen, you're on. Thank you. I hope my sound is pretty good. I'm a little hoarse. We're down here in Houston where all kinds of mold and and straw and everything else that's blown around by the wind um, fills the air with not very not very nice things. But anyway, at least we haven't had the flooding and trouble with the weather yet. February is usually our our disaster time, so we're we're partly home, but not quite there. Welcome everybody to um, our last session. We're going to be thinking about the last book, A Turning. And we're going to see how things turn and uh, what direction they turn in. And I have um, organized part of our discussion today based on some quotations. And they're taken a few from the end of, uh, toward the end of book three, and then some from book four. And I thought we would use these to remind ourselves of some of the events, characters, themes, and whatever directions that the that the that the quotations take us. So this isn't a, uh, it's simply an easy way, or I hope an easy way uh, for us to to go forward uh, with with our discussion. And I'm going to see if this is going to work for me. And it, of course, it's not. I know in just a minute. Uh, I need to get to my controller. Just one sec. I need to do an escape here from this screen. I'm going to have to stop sharing here. I'll stop sharing and be right back. Yeah, here we are. Okay. And then I'm going to share. I have this. I'm going to leave this in this mode um, and share with this screen so we don't have the whole thing. Hang on just a minute here. Share screen. Yeah, I'm not sure that's. And then here we go. Okay, so we'll. This won't be quite as grand as seeing the the PowerPoint unadorned by the extra slides, but it may make it more useful to us. Okay, so here's our agenda. Let's talk a minute about the events before before this this last book, and we are in the we deal with the Lamels. Um, we deal with um, the wondering dinner. How can you live beyond your means? And to think a little bit about what beyond the beyond the means means, and then. Try to understand Mr. Raya. We get more information about him in the last book. And then the twins, because we begin to see two bargemen, one a schoolmaster in disguise, and the other, of course, Rogue Rider, Rogue Rider Hood, who is a bargeman, come murderer, come thief, come all around uh, miscreant. Okay. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, moment of the Lamels farewell to Mr. And Ms. Boffin and to uh, the Podsnap, the Pods, daughter of the Podsnaps. So um, what do you think about, as you think back about the book, where are, what are some themes, what are some moments, characters that you find to be very memorable as we go into this, into this uh, conclusion and tying up. If we've read very many Dickens novels, we know that all the threads are somehow going to be magically tied together, and we're going to see some themes uh, take shape that might have been uh, really in uh, in in skeins of yarn on the floor. So, who would like to name something that is 
interesting. The turning, of course, is a nice pun because all of the much of the much of the plot and many of the characters have been turning, and we some this way and some turning as in becoming something new. So, who would like to just suggest something for us about that? Raise your hands physically. Raise your or hand or just begin. Yes. yes, Glenna. Yeah. And you should unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. I um I wanted to say this is about the fourth time at least that I have read or reread our mutual friend. And this time I found Bella's turning more uh, profound and less I in previous readings I have found her to be a more annoying than anything else mm -hmm. and this time I really um I was really moved by her um uh, her new uh her new um oh, capacity nice. to be you know not entirely self-centered and um I mean, we saw glimmerings of that um so yes I and I I just wanted I, this isn't on your agenda Karen but I want to say right. You're having mentioned several session a few sessions ago that you had uh, written about this text as regenerative and mm -hmm. uh, about the theme of baptism and water mm -hmm. and so on. Your having said that enhanced my rereading so much. So I'm okay. very grateful to you. Good, good. Yes, uh, Bella, uh, I found the same thing in in this reading uh, to pay more attention to Bella. And I think uh, we'll get into in a minute, but I think a conversa the conversation that she has with Lizzie Hexham struck me more this time than before and is, I think, one of the profound movers uh, for Bella as she sees another woman uh, coming into her own, coming into her own identity. And we're gonna actually touch on that in a minute as a turning. Hi, Phyllis, what would you like to say? Hi, Karen. Um, nice to see everybody nice again. To see you. It seems like it's been a long time. I don't know why, but it has. okay. Um, well, I um, I guess I this is my second time through it with with this group, um, um, and it suddenly things just started jumping out at me. This last in this final book, um, uh, all the different um, uh, identities that are not real discovered abandoned um, and we can all know what they all, I mean, there's so much of, of that. And then there's also this whole idea of modernity and, mm -hmm. um, and respectability and is like Charlie, you know, wants to be respectable like yes, people right. look for. But then here are these women, like when Lizzie pulls um, uh, Eugene out of the water. I mean, that right. scene goes right back to the beginning, right? When you yes, pointed out how able yeah. she was with the earth right. and how she could choose to have a life a marriage a very different kind of marriage um right. uh and uh and that 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 redounds back to the boffins and and their temporary um identity is the the golden yeah. dustman and their willingness to give that up and um and then a third thing that really struck me um which is sort of goes back to my old um structuralism, literary criticism, philosophy days is um, the detective stuff yeah. going on. Um, everyone yeah. is a detective everyone. now. That's right. and, and the narrator is, is letting us be a detective when he yeah. gives us a clue to something we know we know, but he doesn't tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so it was, it was okay. really um, a second time through with so. your guidance. I really got it was kind of galloping along, hitting um, high notes the whole way. So thank oh, you. Oh, good, good, wonderful. Hi, David. Hi. Karen, I'm going to call on Karen Kleeman, who also. Oh, I'm had, sorry. Okay. Right. Okay. Oh, Thanks. Um, I think you know the thing that strikes me is that there's so many assumed identities, like Phyllis said in the book, but most people find their way to their own life. And the best people in the book refuse to take the identities of others. We have Betty Higdon, Jenny Ray, Lizzie Hexham, the Boffins in the end, even Sloppy. And I think what the novel is teaching us is to be yourself and how essential that is. 
Uh, it challenges us. It invites us to be genuine, to be genuine in real relationship. And mm -hmm. I think that hit me more with this reading than before. We have a lot of people and things coming back to life. They're made new. They're recycled. Um, they're being sort of made pure. There's fairy tale aspects. I love all the imagination in the book. It's a book about what the imagination sees and the beauty of that. And um, it's just a masterpiece, really. Mm -hmm. okay. David? This follows on things that have just been said. I want to call attention to one remark mm -hmm. that Bella makes, which I first noticed because uh, George Bernard Shaw points it out in writing. A Shaw is good on Dickens often. Bella says to John, I want to be more than, than a doll in your dollhouse. Yes. And Shaw says... Ibsen made a lot of that too. Shaw says, uh, this opens the door to Ibsen. Yes, yeah. And the whole, and the whole notion we have, we also we can't uh, leave out... Um, Jenny Rand and her dolls, <clears throat> and the way that she makes the dolls, excuse me, <clears throat> the way that she makes the dolls to be representations, perhaps of herself, but also of the of the society in in London. And uh, we see the city in miniature uh, in her creation. And so I think the doll and doll house is that's a hugely important thing. and and uh, we'll be thinking about that. Uh, how the dollhouse works and how it doesn't work and whether or not there is a doll. Okay. Right. Yes, yeah. someone else? John, do you see any other hands? I don't. No, uh, I, I'll I'll help with hands, but I, I okay. see none at present unless someone is okay. waving a physical hand. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're we're let's think about um let's think about some of those themes as we get started. The whole issue of uh, being the doll, the one set up, we need to think about uh, Mrs. Veneering is, is identified as the rocking horse wife. There she is the one who is dressed properly and moves what with, with in the way that uh, she is supposed to move, as expected to move. Um, I don't know if there's anything darker than that because there are other issues with that term that, that are um, a little bleaker, but given her position, she at least doesn't know that she is the rocking horse wife or we don't get into her head enough to know that. So we have lots of characters that, that are uh, on the edge of discovering themselves or on the edge, uh, well, most of them. I don't know that, uh, that Bella's mother is ever going to become anything else than what she is, but Lavi, the sister, may, ha may, may have come to, to more understanding of herself. Okay. So let's think of, we're going to think for a minute about the Lamble Fix Finder. Yes. Was that somebody contributing or not? Okay. Um, we're going to look at, at some quotes here. We have the interesting idea that the, that the Lambles have suddenly gone smash. Their, their uh, pretend world, their laminar world uh, has developed a hole in it. <laughs> it's seen to be um, not only... Um, uh, very thin, but in rags now. And we're going to think about how people can believe and live beyond their means. What does that mean? What, excuse that, comp, that uh, repetition, but what's the value? What's the value of living within your means? And how do you live within your means? And what does means mean if living within my means? So we'll think about that for a minute. We're going to look, look just briefly at the, at the Lamels. We have some quotes here. And then we'll come back to our agenda. Let me get this one. Okay. Now, um, is this large enough for everybody to see? Yes. Okay. So this is Lizzie and Bella, and um, this is this is uh, not so much the Lamels as it is uh, a discussion from Lizzie and Bella. But, but the Lamels have gone smash. They are on their way out. We're going to see them in yes. just a minute. But I really uh, would like us to look at this as well. 
I should lose some of the best recollections, best encouragement, and best object that I carry through my daily life. I should lose my belief that if I had been his equal and he had loved me, I should have tried with all my might to make him better and happier as he would have made me. I should lose almost all the value that I put upon the little learning I have, which is all owing to him, and which I conquered the difficulties of that he might not think it thrown away on me. I should lose a kind of picture of him or what he might have been if I had been a lady and he had loved me, which is always with me and which I somehow feel that I could not do a mean or wrong thing before. So this comes before. This is this is Lizzie and Bella in conversation, and we're beginning to see um, how do I live within my means? Does everybody, does everybody see that? How do I live beyond my means? How do I live within? Or how do I take my means and extend them? And this is a very interesting notion coming from the character Lizzie, who has become literate because of, of uh, Eugene. She has become uh, connected in a, in the, with the godmother version of Raya and has become associated with, with the people in the factory town. And so what do you hear in this as we are thinking about, I would lose some of the best recollections, my oh. belief. So what are some Thank things she's telling us here that are part of the turning? Just burst in on us if we don't see your hands. Okay. Okay. You see, Lizzie is seeing herself as a person with means she maybe didn't realize, as a person with my belief, if I had been his equal. Okay. I should lose almost all the value that I put up on the little learning I have. And this is if she were to give in, give in to Eugene. She said, I would lose this. And this is a lesson for Bella. Bella's beginning to understand what live within the means. This is part of the turning for for Lizzie and Bella. Let's take a look at the uh, next one. See if we can get to the landlords. No, here's more Lizzie. Liz, Lizzie. I would lose prizing remembrance that he has done me nothing but good since I've known him. And he has made me a change within me. He has made a change within me. Like, like the change in the grain of these hands, which were coarse and cracked and hard and brown when I rode on the river with father and are made softened and supple by this new work as you see them now. Okay, sorry for that typo in the middle there. Okay. So while this is going on, this is what Lizzie sees in the fire for Bella. A heart will, a heart well, well, I think it's well, I'll say a heart will worth winning and well won. A heart that once won goes through fire and water for the winner and never changes and is never changed. And the figure of which it belongs is most clearly and distinctly yours. So she's seen something in Bella, a way to make or thinking about making a living and the turning as people think to make a living. Well, I'm not sure. I may have lost my my slide for the lambels. I could have. I was having some problems. So if we think about the lambels turning, okay, we'll go back up to the uh, smash for the lambels. If we think about the, the smash for the lambels, we have the strange scene in the Bobbins hmm. breakfast room of the lambels. And it's clear that Mr. Boffin understands their situation perfectly. And he asks which of them is the cashier. Okay. 
and he hands them, hands to uh, Mrs. Lammel, to Sophronia, a hundred pound note. They are hardly finished with that transaction when Georgiana Potsnap runs in and she has just discovered that Sophronia is disgraced, all is smashed. They can't, they're not living within their means and she has brought three five pound notes and a valuable necklace to help them. And Mr. Boffin takes the money and the, and the uh, necklace and he puts it in his pocket to give back to her mother. And at that point, Sophronia says, I appreciate that you have treated me in a way that has been at least respectful. And I'm counting on the fact that you will not disabuse Georgiana of her attitude toward me. And Mr. Boffin agrees. So it, that they, she says, we're going to make our living going to Europe and basically uh, being what they were. Uh, Just a minute, be good, please. What? Yeah. So, what you doing? No, that was uh, not a response, that's someone talking. Oh, okay. So when we think, think about the contrast of Lizzie and Aunt Bella, and then the conversation of Mrs. Lammel of Sophronia with the Boffins. All are discover, all have discovered something about themselves, but there are only two that are going to be able to do much with that discovery, except Sophronia and Alfred will go off into, into Europe, as we discover, and uh, take a residence with an older lady. Uh, we don't know what benefit to what benefit of them, obviously some, but they have finished the scene there in, in uh, London. So David has his hand raised. Yes, David, right. It's, <clears throat> it seems to me that what you're driving at is various ways in which people change the way they see themselves and develop self-respect. Right. Right. And how the, what's interesting about that is to think about making a living. What how do I my how does my change in my understanding of myself change the way I make a living? Um, and the, the importance of that change for this for this novel. We see that in many of the Dickens other novels. Uh, Pip and Great Expectations has has a couple of moments of self knowledge. Um, uh, we see that not so much in in uh, in uh, Dombey and Son. Mr. Dombey doesn't seem to come to much uh, self knowledge. Some, but here we have people who are characters who are telling telling us. Um, and so Lizzie is having, this is a conversation between Lizzie and Eugene at the beginning. Think of me as belonging to another station quite cut off from you in honor. Remember that I have no protector near me unless I have one in your noble heart. Respect my good name. Give me the full claims of a lady upon your generous behavior. She realized she's, she's beginning to see herself with potential, but she's dependent on Eugene who right now before the attack, doesn't realize how quick, quickly he can wreck the effort that she has done. And then we're gonna see just under that, Charlie's conversation to Bradley Headstone. I'm going to put your selfishness before you, Mr. Headstone, your passionate, violent, and ungovernable selfishness to show you why I can and why I will have nothing more to do with you. And how do you know that you have not laid me open to suspicion? It is an extraordinary circumstance attendant on my life that every effort I make for perfect respectability is impeded by someone else through no fault of mine. What's the difference between making a living in this novel and perfect respectability? Do you think Dickens is exploring that idea of what we're talking about making a living? Uh, 
All right. Mm -hmm. Wayne had his hand up a, a little while ago, but I'm not okay. sure. Okay, he... sorry, Wayne. Let's hear from you. We got different views here of the group. I'm going to get a different view. I'm looking at a different screen here to get a different view of the group. There, that's a little better, maybe. So, Wayne, what did you want to? Lost my slide. So what was your suggestion? There you are. No, that's... So what do you think about making a living and respectability? I'll get back to the right slide. What is making a living? Well, Irene, Irene has her hand up, so. Yeah, okay. Irene. Irene. And Glenda as well. Uh, yes. Yes, Irene. What are you what are you thinking? Um, I'm not sure I see the link with making a living here. What I'm seeing is that uh your sort of you know, Lizzie has taken the decision or, or takes a decision just after that to leave, just to get right out of it and have to change her employment completely by joining the, the people by the river. Uh right. but you know, sort of like the Ramos, for example, are going to continue with a type of employment that is no different, really, from what they've been doing. It's still to do with deception and, uh, you know, sort of, if you like, immoral methods of making money. Uh, exactly. Other people's exactly. expense. So they are not changing in that sense. Right. Lizzie is, you know, being forced into a change. But if you think about what she's being offered, if she accepts Eugene's offer, then she would be changing to a very different person. She would be becoming a woman dependent on a man right. uh, and a man who, who, did, who dishonored her. Yes. And but Bradley is actually offering her an honorable way forward, but with not, not being willing to have her make a choice. That's the difference. Exactly. Yes. So, yes. Well, a certainly respectable way, right. And there may be some, an honorable, and as the novel moves forward to the end, where we hear the voice of society, that respectable and quote honorable way may not be a living way to make a living. Does that make sense? May not be the most productive way to make a living. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's move. Let's go a little far further into that. But Glenna has her hand. Glenna, yes. Yeah, well, I wanted to speak directly to what you just said, Karen, because mm -hmm. I think it's not just making a living, it's making a life. Yes, it's, yes, it's good. Creating a life that is based on not exploiting other people as the Lamels do. On right. not, I mean, were um, Lizzie to accept Bradley Headstone's offer, it would be respectable, but it would be based on a completely inauthentic basis. Yeah. Right. She doesn't love him. She uh, is afraid of him. And so how do you make a life where you're not exploiting other people, where you're living honorably? And that is contrasted with the veneerings and their circle, which, you know, breathe respectability. Right. But, um, have no moral core. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, and, and I think we'll probably get back to this further, but... Mr. Twemlow is such a, I, I just think he's such an interesting figure in this novel because you don't really understand the full weight uh, of Mr. Twemlow until you get to practically the last paragraph. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but anyhow, making a life that's not based on exploitation or self-deception, but which is an authentic life. Right. And so if I'm going to make that, hi Phyllis, yes. Uh, yes, I wanted to just, I was just going to that last few pages about Twemlow um, yes. and, and the whole Podsnaps and how they yes. are going to go smash too and live off the diamonds in Calais. And um, I haven't read, I've only read the first six of his novels and now, uh, so I'm not, sh and I've skipped a few of the famous ones, but this really just had, I kept having to reread this last book to 
it, 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 we're going right back to the beginning, but how far have we traveled, you know, to get there? Yes. It, and and it's um and then so I'll just stop there. But I love that you brought up Twemlow because um I've always had a soft spot in my heart for him. <laughs> you know, he's always the piece of furniture, you know, yeah. that could be moved around the dining room table. Right. And there he is standing up for something yeah. that he yeah. obviously has suffered a lot uh, right. because of. Anyway. Right. That's all. And he, yeah. he is not really intimidated by Lord Sneaksworthy, partly, <laughs> of course, he, he has also been freed from the dead, uh, because by this time, Fascination Fledgeby has been peppered and salted enough <laughs> yes. out, out of the picture, and, right. uh, and and things have been, he has a little more wiggle room, uh, but right. they sense, the people must sense some, and uh, I don't, uh, authentic is such a, a, a a Weasley word, but they said something true about him, or they right. would not keep making him the the uh, the the place where they start the table. You know, here's Mr. Twemlow, and then they're going to put a, a a length over here, and then they're going to put a length over here, and then one, and he's going to be the one that that is the sort of um, organizing piece of the yes. of the right, right, yeah. And he wishes he wishes that. Snakesworthy would have allowed him to be something. Yes, yes. Also, the other thing that kept co coming up to me that I kept circling and noting all the way through this, reading this fourth book again, is how many mutual friends there are. Oh, I mean, that's our last I mean, question. Who's mutual friend? Go oh gosh, I mean, it's a Venn diagram, right? It's it's yeah. just, and and mutual friends who don't know their mutual friends, and then another mutual friend makes sure they, and the whole light, you know, more and more like wood, you know, avoiding. I mean, or John avoiding John Harmon avoiding Lightwood, and but I mean, right. it it just goes and goes and goes. I mean, and and then people uh, assuming roles like Rhea and the Boffins, uh, and oh, and and um um uh um uh, uh Venus, yeah. you know, um and 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 in a funny way, it doesn't feel contrived when it's all solved. It it That's feels right. like it had to be. I, I don't, know. yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, uh, yes, uh, that's my my sense of that as well. And um, as we are working with the the turnings, because there are lots of turnings in this this last, I think we see what we thought may have been, or what we are asked to imagine as something that is going in a a, a decent or at least a sensible direction. We discovered it. We discover. Well, you know, Lizzie's connecting to uh, Eugene is not as insane as it is, as it seems at the beginning, uh, as inappropriate as it begins, because he accepts and we're jumping forward, which is fine with me. You know, you make a plan. There's an old saying, you know, if you want to make God laugh, make a plan. OK, and I think when when you're teaching or guiding a, a group of readers and people interested in things, you make your plan and then watch it go smash. And it's OK. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. But I think we'll get to to an end that that is at least useful for th further thought, uh, because we are dealing with uh, to, to go back to regeneration. We're dealing with particular kinds of regeneration that some of them are are very uh, new. Uh, and that the person can, by understand by by education that's legitimate, not not that stuffs the head full of of uh, facts as Mr. Chokum's Childs did in in one in an earlier novel, or that like Bradley Headstone, his head is so full of facts that he can hardly hear what other people are saying, and then it is so full of fury when he realizes the falseness of his situation that being decent and you know, being respectable uh, doesn't, doesn't quite make it. Charlie says, I've been working, okay? I have been working all my life, perfect respectability and other people get in the way. But you see, if we look at that with, and so he can make a living, but that perfect respectability may not be there. But if we look at others who are making life, making a way to be living, um, a Jenny, Jenny Wren would seem to be a strange choice, and yet she is a, a one who sees and makes dolls and makes comments about society in her dolls or makes a profit with her own creativity and commenting about society. 
and then of course, uh, Lizzie Hexham. And we can't forget her name. We need to remember um, that there are three main characters who are variants of Elizabeth. Bella, Isabella, is a variant of Elizabeth. Betty Higdon is a variant of Elizabeth. And Lizzie is a variant of Elizabeth. Of Elizabeth. Okay. And we can't forget that the Victorians, even though they were materialistic, were also steeped in the Bible. So there are two Elizabeths in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in the New. The New Testament is the mother of John the Baptist, right? She's Mary's cousin. And the other one is the daughter of Aaron in the Old Testament. Okay. I don't know what we do with that business, but you see those Elizabeths are there. Betty Higdon fleeing the poorhouse, fleeing someone else, squeezing her life. And Lizzie Hexham comes upon her and what is that that Elizabeth does for the other one? She says, can you lift me a little? And the narrator says, and she lifted her and lifted her to heaven. She can catch her breath so she can escape finally what she was running from all of her life. And so we have, we have these, these biblical notions. Uh, when I was younger and thought I had the answers to things, <laughs> you get older and you realize not so much. Um, I used to think about some of Dickens' novels as being palimpsest onto the Bible. You know, you, you, the palimpsest was a uh, text written over another one. And uh, Hillis Miller says, one thing you've got to be sure is to remember that no matter how secular they were, the Victorians were steeped in, in Bible and doctrine. And, uh, and so we can't ignore that, particularly as we think about turning and as we think about all the falling into and out of water. Okay. Irene so, had her hand up I'm earlier. Sorry. Yes. And we we, we may sure. have missed the moment, but- uh, No, no, Irene, please, whatever you had to say, and Phyllis as well. Karen was just nattering on there. Sorry, I just forgot to put mine down again. So I didn't oh, okay. have any comment at the moment. Okay, no worries. Hi, Phyllis. Uh, me too. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, good. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Let's just, <laughs> let's just go a few, th few we're almost at four o'clock. I don't want to take the whole time with this. But, oh no, we can't do that yet. Let's go back. That's, this is the disadvantage. Um, Let's look at this, the twins. We have Ryder Hood and Headstone, and we had Charlie Hexham and Headstone. These are the, the twins, some of the twins. Can you think of other twins? And then we'll come back and talk about how they're twins. Well, Bella and Lizzie, I would think. Bella and Lizzie, yes, uh, right. And, uh... Well, sort of um, Venus and uh, Weg, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, yes. What about Venus and uh, uh, Jenny Wren? Oh. Yeah. And then sort of opposite twins, it could be uh, Lizzie and uh, Ryder Hood's daughter. Yes, yes. Right. right. Yeah. So what do we make of that when we think about them? Bella, the new Bella does not want to be a doll in a doll's house. And uh, try me through some reverse, John. Try me through some trial and tell them after that what you think of me. What does she realize? What do, Lizzie Hexham has already been through trials, right? And is in one while she's pursued by Eugene. So how are these turnings, how are these making livings or making life or making life worth living as we think about them? And of course, uh, Bella is going to soon be, a, is a mommy. She will be a mother. Well, it, it all sort of stems from John Harmon deciding to turn himself into two or three different people. Right, right. 
maybe he doesn't want to be a doll in a in a doll's inheritance either. Right, right. So he has the living already. He doesn't have to make it. He just has to pick it up. But yes, wants- but he was he was afraid that if he just popped in and married Bella, that she would just be the avaricious person that she was afraid she would turn into be. So he, he's a, sort of the, the master puppeteer for a while there. Yes, yeah. And yet it's an interesting kind of, you see there's a number of levels of puppeteering and doll making as well. Uh, because he sets up a situation in which she can have some trials. Tell them after that what you think of me. Give me some trials. As Twimlo says, I want to be something. I wanted to have something to do to be something. And of course, Twimlo does at the end. He makes the declaration at the end. Who is Could Twimlo's I comment story? on? Uh, yes. Someone who. Irene. Help me, John. Uh, I just wonder if I could comment when we're talking about John. I'm remembering that there was one point where it looked as if one of the wills might have cut him out completely. Yes. Uh, and I wondered what, how that would have changed the way in which the, the novel was resolved if he was not someone with some money behind him. Right. What, do you, what evidence do you think is there that shows that he might have uh, manage that surprisingly well. I think he might have had trouble getting Bella as his wife if he hadn't had any money at all. I wonder if Bella would have made the change she did as completely if he had uh, <coughs> not been someone who could clearly support her. Mm-hmm. Well, he seems to be supporting her pretty well in the small house. Mm-hmm. She seems to be satisfied learning to be the that British housewife. That's true. Mm-hmm. It's sort of in her, in her discovery that she can be a homemaker. She may be learning something that may be part of the test. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that, that's part of the modernity thing too, right? The uh, the Mrs. Beaton's book of household management. Exactly, yes. And and suddenly a woman is not just waiting for the servants to come do things, but she's responsible for engineering the house itself. Exactly, exactly. Right, and that's something that Mrs. Wilford doesn't do. No, no. And of course, Bella's been a bit of a puppeteer herself. I mean, with the cherub father that she dresses yes. and yes. Fe- right. feeds and entertains and pets and strokes mm-hmm. and kisses like a, a baby doll. <laughs> right. Yes. And and you have then uh, pairing that, of course, uh, the drunk who is uh, uh, Mr. Dolls. <laughs> Mr. Dolls, yes. And uh, the bad child. <laughs> that, uh, D- Dickens must have known some Oh, yeah. uh, alcoholics, sure. because some of those descriptions of the DTs and sometimes being sober was worse than being drunk, and the right. the dogs in the public house, it, it, oof, yes. that was pretty grim. <laughs> right. right. What what uh, other observations can we make here about 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 Bella, about Lizzie, uh, about Mrs. Wilfer, any, anything else about Betty Higdon, for example? We have a number of women there uh, in terms of turning and in terms of making a living. Anything more or shall we move on to someone else? Okay, let's, I think that's a move on to somebody else. What do you think? Okay. Let's talk about um, Rogue Riderhood and and uh, the schoolmaster. What does Rogue Riderhood realize about Bradley Headstone? He's not stupid at all. Bradley Headstone has dressed himself up as a doll, right? As a person that looks exactly like Rogue Riderhood. And his intention 
is to blame Rogue Riderhood uh, with the uh, attack on Eugene Rayburn if that becomes necessary. Okay, so we have these mm -hmm. two. And, finally, and Dickens, yes. And Dickens points out that Bradley Headstone always looked very awkward in his schoolmaster clothes. Right. But once he put on the bargeman outfit, it seemed to suit him very well. Yes. So he's <laughs> he's locked in the wrong setting, <laughs> according yes, to Dickens. Yeah. Even though he has the very proper coat and the very proper a hat and the very proper hair controller and all that, that he is he's the very proper one. Right. Right. Okay, so. Irene has her hand up. Yeah, Irene. I just was noting that you know how how clear it is that Riderhood was never taken in by Headstone. That from the start he saw what right. he was up to. Right. Uh, you're right. He is a clever guy. He's uh, he's aware of what's happening, and and therefore Headstone is not going to have the advantage over him that he thinks he will. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So we have that group. We have Eugene and Mortimer Lightwood. Okay. We have one group. Then we have the next group, okay. These are in the men, and then we have Mr. Boffin and Silas Wegg and Venus, okay. David had his hand up. David. Oh, I was thinking about the characters and respectability. Yeah. In a way, the people who are determined to be respectable or in a prison they've made for themselves. Yes. Right. And they're like <laughs> pot snip. Yeah. Pot snap. Right. They want to put things behind them and refuse to recognize yes. things that don't fit. The world has to be the way they see it. Good. It's it's not a freedom at all. No. And and it's one that doesn't uh, doesn't uh, take into account change or catastrophe. It's it is, uh, and we can't put a blush on the chi the cheek of the of the young person. Um, it's something that is uh, imaginary and that it is it is rigid and it also is reflective. It's self reflective. We've got Venerian, Venerian's mirror there, and the reflective heavy furniture of the pod snaps, right. Think about the pod snaps name for a minute. Do you have anything productive if you snap all the pods off of a plant? No, you see, you don't. So pod snappery is you're going to get the plant growing and then you're going to make sure that it's not going to profit at all because it's going to get stuck, stuck there, stuck in the varnish, so to speak. They're also all alike as peas in a pod. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so we have Georgina, who has a man's name, Podsnap, and uh, she has no idea how she will function. So if we looked at Georgina and, and uh, Bella and Lizzie and Jenny Wren, we have very different characterizations of of, of women, and we could put Mrs. Whiffler in there too, Wilfer in there too, um, as sort of a uh, down market Mrs. Podsnap. Okay, so, so as we think about this, the turnings, we see, um, it's not a carousel exactly, but we see the characters come round again and round again and round again, and some of them have not, do not change. And we've talked about the environment in which we, it would keep them from changing. Some of it self-made, some of it like the, the Sophronia Lamel. Uh, she was too clever by by half, wasn't she? Not not seeing that her husband was doing exactly, Alfred was doing exactly what she was doing. And they took each other in. They were so good at it. Right. Okay. All right. Let's take a let's take a look at Twimlo. Whoops, sorry. Hang on here. Let me get to twin level. This is more well, we want to leave that for a minute. Uh, this is Mr. Headstone. Twin one is down here. Sorry. I put this into, into an order, and now you see here's 
Now you see we're out of the order, but it's all right. And this is what Twemlo said. If this gentleman's feelings of gratitude, of respect, of admiration and affection induced him, as I presume they did to marry this lady, I repeat the word this lady, what else would you call her if the gentleman were present? I beg to say that when I use the word gentleman, I use it in a sense in which the degree may be attained by any man. In other words, for Twemlo, Twemlo is a gentleman, right? No matter what Sneaks Worthy does, and no matter how, how tight, how, how constricted he is. And so he may be the voice of society. What would you call her if in relationship to a gentleman, she were his wife? Interesting observations, responses to this. It's an interesting end. the voice of society. Does Eugene finally become a gentleman? Mortimer already, already is, isn't he, a little bit? Oh, uh, Jeff Glenna. I was just going to say, this is one of my favorite endings of a Dickens novel because yeah. um, I just love the role that Twemlo has played throughout. That he can't decide who his best friend is, and he's not—he can't really locate his place in the social world. He knows he has to depend somewhat on Lord Snigsworthy, and then uh, Sophronia makes the confession to him, and he's not right. sure just. You know, he worries that maybe he's done the wrong thing. And, you know, he's never certain of his position in society, who his friends are. And then when he has the chance to articulate a really important value made manifest by the marriage of Eugene and Lizzie, he comes through. And it's it, it, it resonates. Um, sometimes Dickens' endings seem very pat, but this mm -hmm. one seems to me just so resonant and so wonderful. Um, and so Twemlow is one of my favorite minor Dickens characters. Mm -hmm. And certainly he encourages uh, Mortimer, doesn't he? Yep. There's the voice of society. This is uh, the voice, right? All right. Any, any other observations about uh, characters. I'd like to spend a little bit more time with Eugene. Okay. And then we can think about themes and, and uh, talk about regeneration. Uh, in a book where everybody's falling into water and coming out with new names, you see, we have to, we have to at least give a pass to that, to that theme of regeneration and renaming. Okay. Or they make up their own names. Right. All right, so let's let's think about then. Uh, yes, Wayne. Wayne has his Wayne hand. and Tim. Wayne and Tim. Wayne. Wayne first. Where are you, Wayne? Yeah. There, oh. Just uh, let me remind you, Karen, that, that there are several people with the name Tim Clark, and they. Oh, are okay. No, that's right. Okay. Well, Tim. this is a Tim Clark. Hi, Tim Clark. Yes. Okay. So go ahead, Wayne. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. I want to say kind of two things in a way that when I first read Our Mutual Friend, I'd come out of my feminist period in preparing in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, who are the Boffins and John Harmon to think that they can educate Bella? You know, this is insulting. Mm -hmm. You know, Bella can grow up and mature on her own without this elaborate um, charade that she's subjected mm -hmm. to. The flip side of it was that uh, Eugene undergoes a very different uh, reversal when he's beaten right. near, near to death by, uh, uh, forgetting names. Bradley, that's okay. Uh, by Bradley. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. A very different kind of conversion for Eugene. 
Right. Right. Um, yes. So what do we make of that? How could they? They actually did teach her something, didn't they? The Buffins. And they taught it to her in a really interesting way. Mr. Boffin showed her herself by becoming her, by his becoming herself. He says to Rokesmith at one point, oh, don't have any intentions dealing with this young woman because all she wants is money. <laughs> you haven't got any. And, and Bella is right there. And he says, so don't, don't have any don't have any ideas about getting involved with her because really all she wants, all she wants is well. And you don't have any. And Bella begins to hear in someone else's words her description of herself. And she begins to hear in the stories of the misers how important it is to have money, how important it is to, to, to have possessions, how, how important it is. To, to be recognized as someone who's hoarding up these uh, a mercantile and monetary uh, riches. And she is actually horrified that she's seeing her own definition because she's actually said it. I'm going to marry money. That's it. I don't care who it is. I'm just going to marry money and I'm going to marry a lot of it. And so part of that is it is a charade, but part of it it see but part of it is a mirror. Do you see they're holding up a mirror that has more substance to it than the veneering's mirror? This isn't a veneering. This is the real thing, dearie. Here's what you're going to sound like. Here's how you're going to treat people. The way Mr. Boffin treats Rokesmith. Now don't think that you're just a, you're just a secretary here. Don't think you're going to be in charge of anything. You move into this house so I can see what you're doing all the time. And so he shows her by acting it out in drama what she is becoming. And she is stunned. Lizzie could see as well what she was in terms of being Gaffer Hexham's daughter. At some point, she might even have been an accessory to murder if Gaffer had actually done what Rogue Riderhood insisted that he did, and that was kill the guys, throw them in the water, and then pop. I say, oh, look, a corpse. Um, and she was horrified, and she was skilled at it. I have to remember that Lizzie's skill with the boat, uh, and I know we're jumping around here, but the tide, the tide for the Thames, even now in London, is slightly less than 20 feet. Think about that. I live in Galveston, Galveston is very low. Think about in uh, in Santa Cruz, if the tide every other every other morning came in at 20 feet higher than the water is right now. And well, and she could she could hold the boat against the tide. She could use the skulls to hold the boat still against the tide. So she was very skilled at that. And her hands were rough from that work. And she saw herself in that way. And then she saw Eugene looking at her when they were searching for Gaffer and had found him. And he's looking at her, she's in the window, illuminated in the, in the window. And she sees him for a moment looking at her and he's not looking at her as a water girl. He's looking at her as someone else. And she mentions that. So we are seeing people, part of the, part of the business is, is reflective. It's a reflect, I reflect on my reflection and where my reflection comes from. And so in that respect, um, the capacity for change depends, uh, as Malcolm Gladwell will, would argue about the people around us, right? Because Georgina, Georgina Potsnap is lost, right? She's done. She's cooked and might as well take the dad, the boy, the young man that the, her dad picks or the old guy her dad picks and uh, it, before they go smash. Um, and so is Charlie Hexum. He's done too. So they, they, they don't have the, re, the person who is giving them a reflective, 
a reflective experience. So, um, so that's the that's one of the uh, interesting things about about our mutual freedom that that helps that makes the title even more mysterious. And we'll get to that before we start. Um, David has his hand up. David, yes. I think one of the things that's going on in the book is role models, positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And the people who improve in the course of the book profit from this. Mm -hmm. Bella's mother is an extreme negative role model. Right. Uh, Lizzie is a positive role model for Bella. Right. And uh, Mr. Boffin becomes a negative role model voluntarily. Right. Make her think about it. Right. The, right. It seems to me there's a good deal of this. And the people who are fixed uh, in respectability don't think about role models. Right. They know what they're supposed to be and they're busy trying to be what they're supposed to be. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's an interesting commentary on uh, what the what the good citizen or the the uh, proper adult uh, is. Right. Yeah. And you have interestingly then the Milvies. These are the this is the only uh, positive clergy clergyman that we see in Dickens. It's the Milvies, and Mrs. Milvey is worried about the 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 the, the Jewish community that she's living in and, and the Lizzie's that Lizzie's living in, and she uh, goes and checks the school and che and finds that everything is is perfectly healthy, that there's no no concern there. Uh, for her, she does not need to worry about that, about any negative influence. And of course, Mr. Raya has taught the godmother, if she is the, if he is the godmother, he teaches them the importance of going up and being dead for a time, going up and getting away from uh, those forces that would mold them uh, as they can. And as they become literate, uh, Jenny is already literate in street life. She understands lots of things. Jenny, uh, I mean, Lizzie Hexham, Jenny is literate. Lizzie, he Lizzie Hexham has been gen uh, literate in river life, and she understands that. But she's getting other, other experiences that help her. Eugene Rayburn is the interesting one because even though he has uh, some, some, we're not clear what level of wealth behind him, he has, uh, he does not have um, exceptional literacy about professional life or about personal achievement uh, yet. But he gets it the hard way, perhaps. So. Okay. Uh, anything else? Don't want to miss anybody. Because the turnings that we're seeing are quite interesting. The uh, Bradley Headstone is turning you know, like uh, like a uh, piece of meat on a spit. <laughs> He's not going to be able to get out of that that turning. But the others are turning in ways that are very different. Mrs. Wilford probably not. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Wilford, as a the child father, uh, is very close is is a cousin to Mr. Dolls, but he is more effective because he does his work. He does housework, and he does his work at at uh, veneering and sneaks me and so on. And uh, he has his tiny little desk and he puts up with being ridiculed, but he does he does the work that needs to get done. Uh, he tolerates behavior from his daughter that is not, not appropriate, but he tolerates it because she he, appear, he appears to believe that she is being legitimately affectionate to him. So you know, we have interesting parents and uh, and uh, children and siblings. Of course, John Harmon has no sibling. But while well, he has the baby that uh, the Boffins adopt, 
as the second John Harlan. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. Are you seeing a hand, John? I'm not. My no. hand thing is not working. No hand. No hand. Okay. No hands at present. Okay. We welcome hands. Though. We welcome hands. Yes. Hands of every kind. All right. Okay. Well, let's take a look because uh, we're at quarter past four. Yeah. Yes, Karen. Yes. Karen had a hand up. Yes. I do. I, I want to go back to uh, the discussion about Jenny Wren yes. um, just for a moment, because <laughs> I think we should spend some time looking at why Eugene summoned her. Yes. And um, I just found that fascinating. And I think, you know, this is a character who bridges both worlds. I mean, she mm -hmm. has a fairy tale sense. She's luminous. She sings. There are fairies right. that she sees. And yet, Eugene, of all people, really sees her worth. He's very fond of her. And I yes. think he yes. needs her to interpret what he says and what he's trying to say because he's garbled. And the rest of the people around him, even though they're wonderful, don't understand him. And she finds magic and can interpret it, his right. words that nobody else can understand. And I think there's such a strong message in that. It's often the gifts of the disabled. It's the gift sometimes of the mentally ill. They see the world in ways that we don't. And I think that is such a gift. Um, and it's a beautiful part of the book, I think. Yes. I'm so glad you're calling our attention to that because that not to change the subject of what you're talking about, but that also lets us put Sloppy into the book as well. Uh, and his his desire to work and his confusion about how he does that well, but he works well and takes care of the minders and does the mangling. Um, and I think that's, uh, so let's talk about uh, Jenny Wren and and her, her children, her angelic children and ones that come and speak to her. She puts her hair sort of like, uh, a fairy tale person she goes into the halo of her hair and she and she she has she discovers the words i'm wondering um i i wish i could tell you if i told you oh i understand jenny Wren perfectly you would say no you haven't read the book then with any care all right you just she's too complicated for us to just stick a label on her stick a sticky note on her and go but she is a person wayne, wayne has his hand up and so i go lose his comment go, join us in us. join us Yes, join us. I couldn't tell if that was before or now. Join us, join us, Wayne. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, yeah, you're unmuted. Okay, good. Well, uh, of course, Jenny Wren is, I think, a key character. Yeah. But I don't want to leave Eugene without commenting about something that struck me this time. When he's out of his delirium well enough to be understood by Lizzie, that passage is absolutely breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And I think one reason that it, it is, is rhapsodic, mm -hmm. one reason is that Eugene is distantly, distantly echoing what Bradley Headstone had told Lizzie about drawing him to fire, drawing him to danger. And I suspect that Dickens was maybe thinking of that very different uh, dialogue, but the, somehow the, sim the difference there is just uh, powerful to me. Right. Particularly because Eugene has already been beaten, right? I mean, he is, yes. he is yes. in the middle of, of the uh, suffering, whatever it is there suffering and uh, his uh and so yes i think i think that that whole uh conclusion one of the words that lines that comes to me is jenny is not sure that eugene has not floated off into his incoherence and she said is he awake and because lizzie has come and sat down by him and he says yes he is awake and knows his wife and so something about her presence he says, her presence call, you, you bring me back. You bring me back from the hallucinatory world of my illness. You bring me back from floating around. 
And of course, she'd actually been doing that throughout the entire moment of all of the time that he had come to know her because he keeps coming back to her. Uh, he, he spies on her. He keeps coming back to her. And she, she doesn't, he can't understand why that, that returning to her is socially dangerous and also physically dangerous if someone uh, were to construe that as her having a particular kind of character. It would not be safe for her because she might, in fact, be attacked on her own. And she knows she understands the sort of underpinnings of uh, a social society, having been a water girl as well. So, yeah. yeah. Hey. Yes. Yeah. So we have Jenny. Jenny Wren is, she's the doll maker. She's the one who takes scraps and makes things of them. She... Um, she deals with a handicap, a serious handicap. Uh, she is sharp-witted and sharp-tongued survivor. Um, she is a, a constructor, a businesswoman, which is very interesting. Um, and I think of the characters of Dickens. You know, he we've got Silas Wegg on one hand and then Jenny Wren on the other. Those are two very different points in the spectrum of, of someone who uh, is handicapped in some way. And then, of course, one of the major characters uh, is barely able to stand up by the end, if that, by the, by the conclusion of the novel. And what's interesting, too, in the novel at the end is that uh, whose house do they all come to? Where are they all living? Sloppy is part of the sort of servant groups of the house, right? The Boffin slash Harmon house. Yes. Yeah. Where does uh, where will Lizzie and uh, uh, where will the Rayburns live? Aren't they going to live with the Harmons for a time at least? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Jenny Wren not knows Jenny Wren is going to be independent, but connected to them. Okay. Mortimer Lightwood becomes their attorney, right? And and suddenly his uh, his uh, clerk has more business, more work than he knows what to do with. Yeah. So so it's interesting that the house uh, becomes more than than just the, the show-off dwelling place of a, of a fabulously rich man becomes more than that, right? And the secretary, who is uh, uh, John Harmon's secretary? Bella's dad becomes his secretary. He's a business clerk and he becomes John Harmon's clerk. So one of the interesting things is the characters offer, these characters offer uh, new pathways to other characters. And it's, it's not so much a happy ending as a sort of new business enterprise, which is uh, not necessarily the way uh, many of the other novels have ended. Uh, so as we think about uh, about how the novel, how the turning turns and turns and turns, and then finally comes to to at least a, a pause in the turning, but we have a sense at the end that the turning will continue. It may with the characters. Uh, I mean, Road Rider, whose daughter and Mr. Venus are connected. Silas Wegg is out on the street. Um, Sloppy has a place there. So what else do you, what are the other characters? Where are they located and placed? They're pretty much all in the Harmons area, aren't they? Can you think of anybody besides uh, Headstone and of course Riderhood are gone. 
Miss Rider Hood is connected to Venus. Um, the characters uh, at the Veneering's dinners, okay. of course, are not included. Well, so what else do you think? What else do you think uh, that helps us see? Any thoughts about about where that would take us? And we think about Twinlow's voice of society. Okay, let's look at some, let me get down to my last slide here. Let's look at some, here's Mortimer. I would like to talk about Mortimer and Eugene, but we're gonna come back to that, uh, their society. And here's some themes, patterns and themes. Can you think of any other surface and substance? Obviously, uh, that's the Veneering's mirror, uh, the Lammels, uh, Bradley Headstone. Um, we were talking a little bit about livings and livelihoods. What is my livelihood? What is my, uh, how do I make a living? How do I perhaps make a livelihood? What about role playing, um, connecting to maturation? Can I mature as I'm doing role playing? And then other themes. We'll deal with that last question before we start. Um, I think, and uh, since nobody seems to be answering any of your questions, where is everybody? Yeah. They, may have gone, <laughs> they may have left us or they may have gone for coffee. I don't know. Very quiet, but I love what you're saying, and I love the opportunity to see what options and possibilities there are. Anyway, uh, very uh, obviously, Bella is playing a role. Mm -hmm. Right, she is, she is, right. Also, I mean, one thing that comes through is parenthood and childhood. Yes. And who is the parent and who is the child? And that turns around a few times, right? Um, yeah. uh, culminating in the birth of baby Bella. So this right. Bella makes a complete transformation from childish daughter to mother, mm -hmm. to mother of child who we will see <laughs> right. what happens. And then that's also part of I, the ending of this book seems to speak, like you were talking about the different careers and so on, mm -hmm. you know, that people are, First of all, they're becoming a different set of mutual friends, but we won't go there right now. But the other thing is that it, it seems to be Dickens is more modern. This is a more modern way uh, for them to live and a more modern way for him to construct a fiction and end it. Mm -hmm. um, not that he's a modernist, but, but there no. is this feeling of modernity is coming along. That one passage where they're uh, in the train uh, riding above the houses, I, I felt like I was in Chicago. I mean, it was right. just this. Right. And, and then the description of um, where Lizzie's factory, not only is Milby the only positive clergyman, but mm -hmm. that is the rosiest picture of industrial England that yes. Dickens ever painted. That's right. And, um, and, and that it was uplifting and her hands could soften because right. she was a factory girl. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and of course, uh, who was buried nearby, right? right? Um, and uh, so that would be the whole parent-child thing. Uh, being turned around is part of this whole feeling of roles are not what they used to be and they are changing. Right. Yes, and, my, and even more, uh, Eugene is reconnected to his father positively as well. And uh, that's, oh. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, or at least more positively than before. So that could be right. Okay. So any other, so we've got parents, children, parents and children. We have um, livelihoods. And as you suggest, a very, a very modern, more uh, production oriented business type uh, sense of of ending than we have in the others and other of the of the books. Um, 
because Pip, of course, is completely bamboozled by his own his own make believe as he thinks that uh, Miss Havisham has to be his uh, his godmother, <coughs> his fairy godmother, only to discover that it's actually Magwitch. Um, and so that's shocking to him, but we have a very different a very different view here. Um, uh, we have the fellowship, the Jolly Porter's Fellowship, uh, you know, owned by a woman. There, there are lots of different things and managed very well by a female owner. And we have very different types of business that are, you know, uh, that are good, uh, that are, that are, that are uh, acting. We have an, another policeman similar to Bleak House, uh, the detective who finally unravels everything uh, so that John Harmon is not actually arrested for his own murder. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, so any any other patterns or themes? Well, uh, this is, a, there's a lot of death yes. in this. Um, the the canal scene where the it looks as if the earth has died um yes. and boy when the fact that uh, riderhood can't drown you know he's done for <laughs> yes right he says i i yes right um and of course then the many deaths that uh, john Harmon's character mm -hmm. endures the, the dead people for whom john Harmon assumes their identities uh, right. you know um I was trying to think, I don't know, but it just started to strike me that there was, and there was a officer of the death, the, the police officer of the death, uh, I saw that somewhere, of the, of the D-S, anyway, so, um, and then, of course, getting rid of, I'd like you to talk about that, too, okay. having Headstone and Riderhood um, locked together, go, yeah, yeah, right, yeah um let's do that if that's of interest let's uh, as we're uh, we're coming into our last half hour let's think about headstone and riderhood um riderhood believes he can't drown because he has been saved from the river once and we have that very dramatic business uh, which is not a not a regeneration of rogue riderhood but a resuscitation of him where when he wakes up from his near drowning, um, everybody can see that his bad temper, his uh, evil intentions, his selfishness, his harshness, all is coming back to him, and they basically leave the scene of the of the rescue because they're not they're not interested in that anymore. That has no no um, lo no longevity as a concern, and so we have riderhood and and uh, uh, headstone. Why do those, why are those the two? Headstone has already attempted to murder Eugene Rayburn and drown him. And except for Lizzie, he would have succeeded. And that's a terrible irony because he's the person who wants to keep uh, uh, Eugene and, and Lizzie apart. And in that attack, he actually brings them together. And of course, he is horrified to discover that his action actually has contributed to the situation of their marriage. And that's really more than he can tolerate. Um, they become twins, don't they? Because uh, Headstone dresses exactly like Riderhood, even to the point of putting on the red kerchief. And Riderhood is aware of that, that he's going to be made uh, the patsy for for uh, the killing or the attack on Eugene Rayburn. Well, and Headstone even baptizes uh, Riderhood with his blood, right? Yes, that's right. Takes the hand over the thing. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. So, what what's going on with the with that pairing? What's an observation um, that we could could describe of having those two come together uh, 
at some point all dressed identically, Ryder Hood finds uh, uh, Headstone's clothes and brings them to school. And he does a lesson, really a terrifying lesson with the children uh, of the school, which allows Bradley Headstone to understand that he knows everything and he's not going to get any freedom from uh, Ryder Hood, who even suggests he should marry Miss Peacher because she clearly has money in her family and they could take it from her. So he's he's got the plan all created for uh, the Headstone's uh, forthcoming life, actually, just as he had connected pretty much for, for um, Lizzie Hexham. Oh, well. To use a biblical term, neither of them is... Um redeemable right right and so the the only action the only result for them is for them finally to destroy each other which is what they do and they do that uh very uh, uh appropriately perhaps by ending up being crushed by the lock gates and the lock gates are the things that allow uh, the river they would allow the water to go up and down in in, in controllable ways so that boats traveling on one level of a stream could actually get up to another level of the stream, sort of like the, the uh, Erie Canal and other canals where you have to get where things are in multi-levels. And so that's something that should have, that should contribute to uh, complexity of life. But in this case, they were crushed against the, the lock gate and found in the mud uh, in there still in their death grips on one another. Glenna has a comment. Yes, Glenna. Yes, um, I was just gonna say what they have in common, these two characters have in common, is that they both come from very grim upbringings. We yes. can infer uh, more about Rogue Riderhood, but we know Bradley Headstone. Yes. Um, and right. so I guess Dickens is trying to indicate that there are certain circumstances which are so grim yes. for a child growing up that um, do not portend well for right. the possibility of redemption later. Right, right. And we have questions, don't we, about Charlie Hexham, uh, whose thought was to use his sister uh, as a means for the, uh, adding to his respectability uh, by attaching her to Bradley Headstone. But, but he realizes that he needs to be independent of Bradley Headstone or his own situation will be com might be compromised because he might be connected in some way uh, to the attack on Eugene Rayburn. Uh, and so he says, I'm going to have nothing more to do with you uh, for that. You're no longer my mentor. You're no longer my model. Uh, and Headstone then is left pretty much by himself to deal with Riderhood. Hi, Blair. Blair has a comment. Yes. Actually, it's uh, more of a question. Um, we're talking about the events in the um, canal. Right. And I wonder, I mean, with Dickens being such a, a fan of theatrical, uh, of, of theater, mm -hmm of just how dramatic a moment it must have been for the Victorian reader to read of a woman rescuing yes. a man. Yes. And I, I raise that because as I'm sure I'm not the only one who's aware that the most popular, most often produced melodrama of the late 19th century was Under the Gaslight. Mm -hmm. And in that, the uh, moment of highest drama involves a woman rescuing a man from the train tracks. Right. And uh, so, again, I just, I just wonder what, what you think of the uh, dramatics of that moment. Of well, Li Lizzie, go ahead, please. No, no, it's your, I would simply say pretty much what, what you're saying, and that is, this is, it is a, she is, it takes us right back to the beginning of the novel where she and her father are out on the river and they have, they have a body connect, attached to the boat 
and she can't bear to look at it because as the water flows over it, it seems to have a face that is uh, changing in its expression from the, from the water. And she cannot, it's a, it's a, uh, a way of making a living, if we're going to talk, go back to that theme, that she finds repulsive. And because I think she's also aware that her father may be contributing to the uh, prizes that he finds in, in, a, in uh, illegal and immoral ways. So we're taken back to that. And I think her strength, she says, my hands are softened by the factory work, but she has not lost her strength to, to basically connect Eugene, in, get him into the boat or connect him to the boat, get him to shore and then manage to pull him away from the shore so that she can get help. So this is someone totally in a non-feminine behavior. And I think that's uh, that's startling because we see it with the manager of the Jolly Porter's rest, uh, uh, bar and uh, uh, and we see that. And I think this is uh, this is would be a shock. I think it would be a shock. And that old way, as she says, that old way has value, that old job uh living and working among the dead and with the dead resuscitating in this case resuscitating the dead uh has has value to her and she's able to do it and i think it is a, a stunning idea uh and one that should be perhaps considered more um as we as we think about are there other women in the well you, in the dickens novels that uh, accomplish something similar to this um, can I also ask, wonder if there is a link here to the Grace Darling story, which I think was current at the time of Dickens, The yes. Rescue by Grace Darling. Yes. I wonder if there's a parallel there with Lizzie, and particularly the, you know, the woman who, the young woman who was able to row out in the storm and save the, the shipwrecked sailors. Yes, yes, right. I, I suspect there is, and he's, um, it's hard to know no, it's not a good idea to try to imagine what was in a writer's mind, particularly a mind that had so much in it as, as Dickens, and particularly at this time of life. But I think that to be rescued, he thought that Ellen Ternan, to some extent, had rescued him from something. And, you know, that's questionable. But uh, the, pow the power of women to be rescuers, to, to resuscitate, um, is, brand is new, and it's very modern. Does that help at all? I don't really have an answer to that, but it's, it's an idea, Blair, that we can take and go forward uh, to think about. Um, anybody else want to continue that? Because I think it's it's right. It would be shocking um, because the the gappers were not respectable people at all, dealing as they did with pretty much with the dead or creating the dead and then dealing with them. So, uh, yeah, I'm just checking the the Grace Darling story was 1838. She was the lighthouse keeper's daughter. I can't help seeing a lot of par possible parallels with Lizzie oh. there that would still be in the mind of the readers at that time. Yes, I think you're. I think you're right. I think that is a that is an important uh, uh, connection. An important um, sort of echo. This echoes that. Yes. Yeah. Lena. I was just going to say, um, thinking about the role of various women, and certainly the Re Lizzie's extraordinary heroism in right. rescuing Eugene, but uh, the characters, there aren't many women characters in this novel who are the insipid Victorian uh, prototypical, uh, you know, angel in the household characters, right. because Bella, I was thinking when we were talking about Bella earlier, she's like the anti-Dora. Yes. David yeah. Copperfield, she's competent. She's uh, at that at that point, uh, being a housewife was not an empty job. It was a real job. Right. Because, uh, you had to have all kinds of competence to do, to run a household. Right. Whether you had servants or not. And, um, you know, Sophronia has a moment of redemption, although, she has to settle eventually for the moral quagmire she shares with her lovely husband. Right. Um, Mrs. Wilfer is horrific. Mrs. Boffin, it, I, in other words, there are many rich, interesting women characters. Now right. I know John Jordan 
does mm. not think Esther is in Bleak House is one of the insipid women and I'm on your side. Bleak House has uh, Esther, who's a really interesting character. Florence Dombey is an interesting character. Right. But there are other Dickens novels where the women characters are pretty uh, insipid. But right. this novel has very few of them, I think. Right. Well, if you think about Biddy in uh, uh, Great Expectations, you know, she's the one who starts out with her dots, her shoes down at the heel and her stockings down, and she can't, she can't say dressed and pretty soon she is the school mistress's uh, assistant and then develops other skills to take over for uh to take over as joe's wife and no. produces the son so that's interesting as well she's interesting as well uh, uh, so right i think that would be that's the 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 rescue i think is is a stunt is a surprise and yet not a surprise because Lizzie has to understand that her old life, her old life has value in a new context. And she uses that old life, those old skills that she found so horrific in a way that actually, she doesn't know that the victim is Eugene Rayburn until she gets him on shore or she gets him close to shore. And then she can see the face and realize that even though it's beaten and bloody, she can tell who it is and the great scream uh, echoes over the the river and the lake, and and uh, she uh, she understands what she has what she has managed, but she doesn't immediately go to his bedside. So she keeps that distance, and she only goes to her bed his bedside when she is summoned, and summoned to take uh, a particular role. And so that's interesting. She doesn't come. Uh, as 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 Eugene says, yes, he is awake and he knows his wife. So she has come to take the role that she found so disturbing, so potentially destructive for herself uh, earlier, that she would she would lose what she'd accomplished in in finding herself. And she said, I don't, I can't lose that. I can't lose it because she was in a male dominated world with her brother trying to, rock, trying to marry her off to Bradley and uh, to her father. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That, that would have been a surprise. Uh, when I read the book for the first time, I was not prepared for that attack. I knew Bradley Headstone was, was hanging around there and then Eugene was so sure of himself, he missed him, a walked past him a couple of times uh, after Lizzie had gone on toward, uh, toward home. And, uh, and but I was not prepared for her to be the one that rescued him uh, or to be the one that calls him back. And the interesting thing that he floats away and then comes back and floats away and comes back. But when she's there, she is the anchor, she holds him. Uh, and when she says, my dear Eugene, he's, he's back, able to talk to her and, and to be aware of what's going on around him. And so that's a surprising as well. Uh, and so when he said earlier, riddle me, riddle me, riddle me, re, can you tell, I can't tell what I'm supposed to be. Uh, at least he has one identity, and that's of her husband. So that's good. And he's, uh, so the last, any, that's great. I'm so glad you brought that up. So glad you brought that up because the one of the modernities here is the a changing role of women. Uh, and the position, the the responsibility of women as business persons, as uh, as comment, social commentators, as Jenny is in the dolls that she makes, and she's also a businesswoman, also the daughter who's having to care for the for the uh, alcoholic and ill father. Uh, uh, even Betty Higdon, who is the the woman is working hard to escape the poorhouse. She's the one who's had the minder. She's taken care of children that uh, did not have someone to take care of them, at least during the daytime. Uh, and she has, she has managed her own situation so that she has in her in the bodice of her dress the directions and money for her, her burial. She's got the, her last plans ready to go. Uh, and she has taken a little business along with her, her basket of goodies to sell uh, to keep her uh, going. So she's made a plan. 
So it's very interesting uh, to think about the women characters. Okay, last question. Who is our mutual friend? <laughs> or what is our mutual friend? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> well, um, reading the in in lieu of a preface. Okay. Um, this sounds glib, but I think it might be Dickens. Okay. Uh, just the way he puts his own epitaph, <laughs> the okay. end. Okay. On on the novel and okay. himself, but. I'm reaching here. <laughs> I'm not <Okay>. sure. <laughs> I don't. I. I don't, don't wait for me to give you an answer. I have an idea, but not an answer, because it's such a wonderful title. Our mutual friend. Who is that? I know it is. And talk about drawing the reader in. I mean, <laughs> our mutual. Our friend. Mutual not your friend. mutual friend. Your, mine. Yours and mine. Right. It's yours right. and mine. And I've read the book several times thinking, okay, who is my mutual friend in this book? Right, 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 right. Well, Twemlo. <laughs> yes, yes. He's there. He's, he's, he's more than the furniture, although yes. they see him as furniture, as furnishing. He is more as than furnishing. Right. Glenna and Trudy okay. and David have hands. Uh, lots, just, yes, just speak up. Don't well, um, let me just say, my first thought when I first read it was that John Harmon was the mutual friend because okay. he knew the Wilfers and he knew uh, and he ingratiates himself under a, a persona as the, right. with the Boffins. But uh, I'm now more and more persuaded that Twemlo is is the guy. And okay. with that, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> okay. All right. For Trudy, hi. What, what do you think? You're, you're muted, Trudy. I really have no right to comment on this because I have not had a chance to reread the book. And, um, but there was a word that, that you used in, when we were talking about, um, I think it was when we were talking about the role playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you talked about fellowship. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I like Glenna, I initially thought it was of John Harmon as being uh, the mutual friend. But mm -hmm. I, I think, when, and when you talk about the ending, where people are living together, right? It's such a different ending from other endings. Uh, I think possibly the idea of mutuality mm -hmm or fellowship is mm -hmm. what the book is all about. Okay. You know, I have nothing to back it up. <laughs> well, I, I think that, I think you're right that there is much in that, even from the fellowship of the, of the Jolly Porters or right. uh, that, that uh, enterprise there with the very careful rules about how behavior and so on. And then the fellowship that Raya has with uh, Lizzie and Jenny Rand and then the uh, fellowship of the community, the factory community where Lizzie can take refuge. Uh, and then of course the, the healing fellowship with, uh, with Eugene's recovery. That yes. Well, and, and, and the, the idea is, you know, who survives in this book? <laughs> yes, yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. And it's the, it, the people who survive are the people who establish uh, mutuality in their relationships. Yeah, yeah. right. So it may David, be the, right. That, that, yes, yeah. David and then Dan Stewart. Okay. Okay. Uh, I agree with Trudy as usual. That's always safe. That's good. It's always smart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the line that keeps coming into my head is from Christmas Carol, where Marley's mm -hmm. ghost says, "Humanity." It's yes. our business. That's right. Yeah. I had made that connection. That's very, very, very good. Very interesting. Yeah. 
Dan. Um, I don't know if we went over this, but I think in terms of like an individual, it's kind of indeterminate who the mutual friend is, but I wonder if the main mutual friend would be the river itself, the Thames itself, which provides kind of a livelihood for a lot of characters. It's also literally the life and death of them. Um, and in a lot of ways, it is kind of the throughway through the narrative itself. I mean, really kind of, um, you know, from the from the dust mounds you know on the, on the shore to the um to all of the people that kind of arise up around it to right. you know um geographically located in london but also kind of upstream in right. so many places. so um i've always kind of thought that would be the most likely character although there's you know other theories like people have brought up yeah i think that i think your idea has has much merit because of the the um uh, sort of encompassing influence of the river on even uh, from the beginning through, uh, or at least uh, through the the novel, I think that uh, that that certainly that certainly is something that could be, I think, uh, supported. That idea could be supported. And our mutual friend, if we were taking that in a more theological notion, you know, we have River Jordan. We have all kinds of rivers that have been important in spiritual history, and we have uh, the whole notion of, of uh, baptism or drowning in water, baptism or drowning in life. Uh, how do I make my life? Nicodemus Boffin, remember, that's naughty Boffin is Nicodemus, the character in the New Testament. What's the question of Nicodemus? He comes in the middle of the night, so the other members of the Sanhedrin will not see him speaking to this upstart Nazarene. And his question is, what must I do to be saved? You see, so if that's the question, then it may be our mutual friend is the answer. And it could be the river. It could be uh, nature, what gives us life, what can take it from us. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that's, I like that idea to think about that because that wouldn't be the first, that's not something that would be completely foreign to other Dickens novels at all. So yeah. Irene has, Irene has a thought. Okay. Irene. Yeah. I, I'm looking at the more, it seems to me, the most obvious one of all, Mr. Botham. Okay. Because so much of the action depended on him from the very <laughs> beginning, from him taking Wegg under his, his wing, from him re ident, re being right from the start willing to hand over his fortune to, to John Harmon and, yes. and seeing and recognizing John Harmon, even though he was yes. you know, hiding his identity. I just feel that so many times he is a friend to everyone. Yes, and you're in different ways. I, I think that that has real merit as well, too. Yes, and uh, and his question is, how do we how do we keep all this going? How do we keep this together? And he realizes mm -hmm. that he has to do some. He has to give um, Bella a really mm -hmm. good understanding of what only being interested in money means. Mm -hmm. And so yep. he creates that experience for her. Uh, and I love the fact that he and the old lady, as he calls her, have have the the parlor area that's his side and hers, <laughs> and they're living uh, interdependently there. Yeah, Karen, I think the last word belongs to you because we're almost at the end of our time. Well, I think the last word is that people who are readers of Dickens are astute students of human experience. Uh, they are wonderful influences on one another as they increase our understanding of our own personal experience, uh, our understanding of how our culture got here in the first place by thinking about Dickens. Uh, and I think we are a that we are a character. We are mutual friends, uh, literally friends of the Dickens Project, and we are mutual friends in our focus on Dickens and in the the discipline of being friends. And I think we get that in our mutual friend as well. How do we do that? And we also get that in our in our guidance from people like uh, John and others on how to how to make a fellowship. And so I think that's the that's the last word. Karen, that's a lovely thought on which to end. Thank right. you so much for your guidance through these sessions on our mutual friend. And um, 
please, won't you all join me in thanking Karen? And oh, you're so welcome. Her. It's been too much fun. Thank you so much. The right. mystery thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Right. The mystery of Edwin Rude <laughs> starting you. Thank in you. January. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you all for. Continuing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. Nothing but love for you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Karen. All right. Thanks. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. Okay. All right. It's been wonderful.